During the following portion of this presentation, we experience technical difficulties. The problem does get resolved, and the quality will improve shortly. Thank you for your patience. Okay, so we'll start off. I'll go back up. I'm hoping it's just me that's here again. Um, a very quick agenda before we go through, just because it's one of those things you've got to do. Okay, so we'll spend a few seconds talking about who we are, what we do. Um, we'll go into what the talk's about, why it's important, or why we think it's important enough to have fiddled along with it a little bit. Um, go into some background with timing attacks, timing attacks as they relate to the web. And then we start looking at timing as, um, as it shows up in our talk. So as a channel, as its own vector, um, we'll look at the privacy implications with timing attacks, look at some, some acronyms, just because the world can always use new acronyms. Um, and at the end, we'll stop and take some questions and hopefully not have some thrown at us. Okay, um, so really quickly, SensePost, um, we are a small South African company. Um, we've been around for a bit, so we were formed uh, way back in 2000, in the internet years, that's ages ago. Um, we've written a few papers on diverse stuff, so from application testing, network testing, um, even some stuff on worms and horrible tales of doom and destruction. Um, we've spoken in a few conferences. Some of you might have seen some of our talks at Black Cat, which is why we surprised we came back. Um, we've, we've been at Black Cat for about six or seven years. Um, we've written a few books, um, shows you what the publishing world's come to. Um, and we've just done a bit of training, um, so we've had a few classes. Some of you guys that have been on the classes, and we see you recognize the faces. Um, for the both of us, that's me, and that one's Marco. We probably spent most of our time on this picture, so there's not a lot else to the talk. Um, we spent most of our time on Simpson as me and never came back. Um, Marco and I are security researchers with SensePost. Um, we spend most of our time fiddling, breaking stuff, um, doing client assessments, client engagements. Um, that's about it. Um, like every man and his dog, we've also got a blog. Um, so if you guys ever have time to kill, visit the blog. It's better than a book in the eye. Um, so really quickly, what is the talk about? Okay, um, the name should give it away. Largely, it's about tagging stuff. Okay, um, that's a little bit generic because a little bit when we had started, we wanted to time a whole bunch of stuff. So you see that timing is playing a more and more important role in lots of the assessments that we do. But it's one of those things that as soon as you spot it, you start to spot it everywhere. And it's one of those things, in the end, we scaled it down to just timing as it related to web application assessments. Um, why you should care, why you should care, if you're a developer, um, for a long time developers have been told to prevent information leakage, okay, and a fair amount of work has gone into making sure that you don't just give information away. Um, nowadays most of the web frameworks will give you a generic error message handler, um, something that you get almost out of the box these days, okay, what you'll find is you're still leaking information by a timing attacks, and it probably defeats the whole purpose. Okay, if you're a pen tester, what's interesting is, unless you're checking properly for timing attacks, you're sometimes missing entire attack vectors. Okay, um, once we started discovering timing, one of the things that surprised us was how often we act it actually reared its head. Um, and it's probably interesting for you because it's probably happening on your assessments also. Okay, if you like new acronyms, then, then we're there for you also. So we've got XSRT, which is not truly ours, and to try to make it truly ours, we introduced the D in front of it. So it's not just cross-site request timing. Um, we're going to ponder distributed cross-site request timing, um, and we'll explain what it is and why we think it's cool. So I'm going to take over and introduce Echoes at this point. Um, before we get into the cool stuff that we've got for the presentation, I will give a little bit of a background just on time attacks in general and, and focus that towards uh, 
timing on the web. So if we look um, on side channel attacks, so we step in all the way back, side channel attacks have got this illustrious history um, against computing systems in various ways. Um, and two of the hardware based uh, side channel attacks that we generally hear about are power analysis and radiation emission ana analysis. And the attacks there basically are whereby the attacker is attempting to infer uh, actions of a device under observation based on certain physical attributes and characteristics um, that the attacker can see. And one of those is the power that the device will consume, the second one is EM radiation. But those two attacks are specifically focused against hardware. Um, and for what we do, which is application level testing, uh, they kind of come up within our uh, area of expertise. So the third one there is time analysis. Now time analysis um, is effective against both hardware and software. I um, mean, it's, it's interesting for us because uh, it's possible to perform time attacks over networks, right? So instead of having to physically sit in front of a machine or in front of your device, you can actually perform this um, over some kind of network on the other side of the world. And of course, timing and analysis would be effective against both hardware and software. In our case, though, we're focusing Software. So if we look at time attacks against software over the years, the traditional domain of time attacks has been in crypt analysis. So there's been a bunch of papers over the years dealing specifically with time attacks. Um, in 1996, Paul Copper had uh, one of the first results against RSA on a local machine. He found out that he could time uh, RSA operations and thereby recover bits in RSA key. He also had results there against the Hubble. Um, a little later, uh, Brumby and Bona had results against RSA as well, but the significance of their uh, paper was that they were able to recover keys across the network. So they weren't limited to sit in front of the device. So immediately, at this point, we're starting to see that the usefulness of timing becomes apparent. I mean, in fact, what they were able to do was to derive keys in an open SSL install. So it wasn't uh, some kind of theoretical attack, it was actually a real world effect of attack. A year later, Daniel Bernstein um, derived a full key for AES across the network. Okay, now AES had a prop or has a property whereby uh, it uses lookup tables. And what Bernstein's observation was is that lookup tables uh, will cause an algorithm to be non-constant time. And so what he did was he wrote a custom network client and server, and from that he could derive keys. And his observation there was that in order to make this generic in real world, all you would require are more samples. So the attack is not less effective. I mean, just a couple of years ago, I'm sure most of you recall, Clive Percival had his uh, fairly well publicized attack against hyper-threaded processes, whereby, again, now we're taking to a local machine a spy process running in parallel to a process that was conducting RSA operations could derive bits in an RSA key. Um, and the way that he did that was with cache line hits or cache misses on the album cache of the hyperthreading process. Um, what his uh, methodology was, was to observe uh, the misses in the cache. From that, to infer the operations that the other process was conducting, and from that, he could infer which bit uh, the process was dealing with at that point. So as you can see, there's been a bunch of papers. Obviously, there's a lot more, but these are some of the significant results of um, the time and attacks in recent years. And these focus specifically on cryptanalysis. If we move a little bit forward to uh, timing and the web, you'll see that actually we're moving backwards. In 2000, Felton and Schneider had a paper where uh, they discussed the implications of timing attacks on the web. So at that point, 2000, the web was becoming understood, and Felton, who's got a strong interest in privacy, uh, decided that this would be a fruitful avenue to explore. And what they did was they focused on privacy, so they stepped away from cryptanalysis and they applied timing attacks to the web. And what they found was that the timing attacks were very successful. Dead. No, I'm dead. Um, so they focused on privacy specifically. They had four attacks. Um, two of those are, are, are of interest. The first one was 
based on JavaScript, we're using JavaScript to time um, requests to pages, they could determine if that page had been in the user's cache or not. So obviously, if the page is in the user's cache, the load time is very short. If the page was not in the user's cache, the load time would be a little bit longer. Um, and the second result that they had was that they used a job applet to initiate DNS lookups. And based on the timing of the DNS lookups, they could determine if certain queries were in the DNS cache. So that's a DNS cache snooping attack based on time. So as you can see, uh, there has been some work in the area of climate attacks on the web, and we'll get to one more shortly. But the last point in the slide basically points to, uh, it's not actually related to timing, but we want to introduce it since we use this technology. In 2003, Lars Kinnaman uh, used, he basically released this little Java applet, uh, or this piece of JavaScript that could interface with Java in order to pull your local network interfaces into JavaScript. So basically what he showed was the interface between JavaScript and Java classes and using those in a web page. So this is the final slide on timing. I called it web time.0. It's a pun. I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> but uh, clearly it's not appreciated. Um, <laughs> Uh, last year we had, at Black Hat, uh, we had two separate JavaScript, or JavaScript-based port scanners were released um, by both Grossman and Nitzilkowski and Spy Dynamics. And both of those used an implicit timing attack. It wasn't explicit. So what they would do is they would attempt to load a page from a particular uh, host on a particular port using you know, a variety of tags, script, image, or whatever. And they would then wait for a couple of events to happen. One of the events that could happen was an on error because the page failed to load. Okay. And at that point, what you're doing is you're using an implicit timing attack. You're waiting for a timeout to occur, and from the timeout, you're inferring a particular state. And in this case, um, the port's not actually closed. It's probably not there. Uh, it's probably there's not a host there if the connection times out. And then this year, in fact, uh, Andrew Bortz and his colleagues from Stanford released a very interesting paper on timing and the web, uh, and really brought explicit timing attacks into web applications today. And what they discussed were two separate types of timing attacks. The first was direct timing attacks. Um, in a direct timing attack, what they would do is the attacker would make requests and time those requests and infer information. So for instance, the kinds of information that they were inferring were whether usernames were valid or not. Um, and they were also inferring, uh, for instance, the size of a user's private galleries or picture galleries in a, in a photo gallery application. So those were direct timing attacks where the attacker would say, test this username. Based on the timing of that request, I can say if that username is valid or not. And the second uh, item that they introduced was what they called cross-site timing. Now, Harun will no doubt expand on it a little later, but basically, we were, when we were dis or coming up with this uh, presentation, we came ac or we decided upon this term and then searched for it and found the board's paper. So it was a little disappointing for us, but also exciting to know that other people are also thinking about these same kinds of things. Um, madness in numbers, I guess. So their cross-site timing um, attack was, was, uh, went as follows. Basically, they would load an image tag um, and point that at a particular website, um, and then they would also have an on-error handler for that.